we want to continue in that spirit of prayer and ask God to open our hearts and minds as we open the word. Uh, would you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may your word be our rule, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your greater glory be our chief concern. Open in our hearts and our minds to hear you speak and guide us to open hands. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, risen and reigning Lord over all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, how many of you know what a Rube Goldberg machine is? Right? All right? It's not totally foreign to many of us. Many of us, as, as kids, were introduced to to it through the board game Mousetrap. It's like a contraption or a machine where one action sets off the next action, which sets off the next action, and there's this uh, absurd amount of activity that happens to get to the the final process of whatever the end result is. So in Mousetrap, you're the you're the mice, and you're going around the board to get the cheese, but somebody get, somebody gets that space, and they get to send one of you to the cage, and so the boot kicks the marble, and the marble like drops into the bathtub, and the bathtub spins around, and the diver dives in, and then the cage drops on the mouse, right? Mouse trap. All right. So like ten years, like in the last ten years, maybe the most famous Rube Goldberg machine came in the form of a music video for the band OK Go to their song This Too Shall Pass, and it starts with dominoes which is pretty amazing, but it turns into an entire warehouse full of this chain reaction of this machine that they've created of action leading to action, of leading to action, leading to action, and leading to action. And the, the origins of the Rube Goldberg machine, like it was often to kind of point to the absurdity of something, of like this is a really complicated way to get to an end result of something. So we're actually going to shut this off. You're not going to be allowed to watch <laughs> the entirety of the OK Go music video, but you can find it online if you want to. It's fascinating. Um, but you're stuck hearing me talk instead. So, but here's the thing. In, in uh, Romans chapter 12, Paul, the apostle Paul, is writing to the church in Rome who he had never met. And it's not absurd at all, but he sort of sets off this chain reaction As he writes, so in in chapters 1 through 11, he has set up a a theological foundation for who Christ was, who Jesus Christ was, and um, what it means to be saved by Jesus, what it means to be included into the people of God, to be a sinner saved by grace. And he gets us to chapter 12, and he starts looking at the implications of that. And right out of the gate in these first 10 verses, there's a chain reaction of just one thing seems to lead to the next, seems to lead to the next. Um, You're invited to stand in body or in spirit while we read this passage together. Romans chapter 12, starting right at verse 1. Notice how these things seem to just come on the heels of one another. And at first, they maybe don't seem like they're related to each other, but we know Paul is writing these Back to back to back for a reason. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to these words from the book that we love. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function... So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. 
If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. So we're in week two of a three-week series on generosity. What does it mean as Jesus followers to live the generous life, to live generously uh, or open-handed, as Pastor Marshall pointed us to last week? Way back in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, God has always had the plan in place for his people to live open-handed. So we've broken it down into three ways to think about it. Um, gener- living generously with your time, which Pastor Marshall preached about last week. Next week, Pastor Bob will talk to us about what it means to live generously with our treasure, the things we possess. And this week, we get to take a moment and think about what it means to live generously with our talent. Um, the, the chain reaction that is set off here by Paul that gets us to his passage on gifts and how we are gifted and how those should be used for each other. It's a full chain reaction that starts in a very important spot. So like this generosity logo, I love this. Marlies Sherwood is our director of uh, communications and uh, she designs our logos among many, many other things and I love this logo. It's uh, Newton's Cradle, you guys know the Newton's Cradle. You see them on large desks in business offices on the 37th story of skyscrapers in movies. That's the main place you see Newton's cradle, right? And it, it tells us some of Newton's laws of physics. And what I loved about it is, is when I saw Marlise's logo, I kind of thought, wow, this is great. If I commit to living generously, then the momentum from that will trigger other people to live Generously, how cool is that? And in studying and preparing for this week, I was humbled and immediately reminded that our starting point is not ourselves, but our starting point is Christ. He who was God but did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing, being made in human likeness and being obedient to death, even death on a cross, And in Christ's mercy and in his death and resurrection, we see Jesus as the example and the reason for generous living. Christ starts the process and invites us into it. I'm not going to leave that going the whole time. But Christ starts it, and Paul does that here after 11 chapters in view of God's mercy. That's his starting point. And that's our starting point today in view of God's mercy. So let's go like kind of sprint through the chain reaction pretty quickly, okay? Uh, Christ is the example. He's the reason in view of God's mercy. Present your bodies. Um, This is an acknowledgement, and sometimes it's good to come back to this, that we are embodied people in a physical reality, and that's not a bad thing. We're not trying to escape to some higher, more enlightened, spiritual state. You're a physical person in a physical place, and that's exactly how God created us. And out of this, Paul acknowledges that, and he says, uh, you present your Your body, which the way he's talking about that means your whole self, heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything that you are, and you present yourself as an offering for worship. So we go from the view of God's mercy to a response of worship, and he uses worship language here as a living sacrifice. That's worship language, liturgical language. Uh, This is your true and proper worship. What that means is simply this is right and good and appropriate, is that your whole life would be in response to Christ's mercy. And that would lead us to transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Resist and push against the ways of the world that you're, you're being called to follow, but instead let the word and the Holy Spirit transform the way you see reality, that your whole mind would be renewed. And out of that, 
Humility grows from those roots. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. No, think, think of yourself soberly, honestly. Think of yourself in a, in a way that's honest. It's not, uh, it's not throwing yourself on the ground and saying I'm worthless. It's being honest about how valuable you are in, guy, in God's eyes, but that you are not above anyone else. So the, the humility grows out of the roots and the trickle down then from God's mercy is that those of us who are in Christ Jesus, who are sinners with dark hearts, who have been saved by the grace of Jesus, would allow humility to grow. We would gain no glory from this life, this world, but we would humble ourselves. And if that happens, it wouldn't be surprising if a community was formed in this group of humble people that follow Christ. In Christ, though we are many, we form one body. So, okay, we are often concerned as, as individuals uh, in a consumerist society, we are often concerned uh, as Jesus followers with what it means to be a Jesus follower. That's a good thing. The New Testament writers are also concerned with that, but they are often concerned with what it means to be a community of Jesus followers together. It's, it's so much broader. There is something about belonging to one another that is vital, and we belong to each other in Christ. Our uniqueness is not erased by Christ, and that needs to be noted. A community of Jesus followers will be made up of different people with different backgrounds and different experiences and different gifts and different passions. Or to say it another way, unique individuals become a unique community in Christ, marked uniquely by generous living. That should be one of the main marks for the people of God, is generous living that echoes the mercy of God for us in Christ. And the result then is a generous outpouring of talents and gifts and skills and abilities. So we're talking about this uh, in generosity and in, in time and talent and treasure, but I adore the, the word gifts in this passage, and I'm probably gonna use that more than the word talent as we go. Um, but maybe it helps to start with the word talent. The, the definition, if you look it up on dictionary.com, the first two entries, a special natural ability or aptitude, or the second one, a capacity for achievement or success. So quite honestly, quite simply, what are you good at? What are you good at? Like that's, that's, that's the easiest starting point to kind of think about talent. But the term gift here maybe opens our eyes even more to the beauty of this. In, in verse six, as Paul's writing, he says, we have different gifts. If we look at the original Greek, it reviews something, reveals something really beautiful to us because that that word gifts in the original Greek is the word charismata. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. The root of charismata is the word charis. Charis is that word grace. Your gifting, what you have been given by God as a gift or a talent or a skill or a passion to be developed is God's grace to you. And not only God's grace to you, it is God's grace to you for the sake of other people. I think that becomes obvious in the way that Paul is writing here. These skills, these talents, these abilities can be cultivated, they can be developed to benefit others as a gift of grace. Now, Paul names a handful of gifts in this passage. And within the New Testament, in a couple other passages, there's a subset of gifts that we in the church will refer to often as spiritual gifts. The basic idea is that the Holy Spirit, these are Holy Spirit given, and they are Holy Spirit driven, and they are specifically first for the building up of the church. Paul names two of them here, uh, 
prophesying, prophecy, a gift of prophecy, or a gift of teaching. These show up in other lists in the New Testament about spiritual gifts. Uh, you'll find those in 1 Corinthians 12, or you'll find those in Ephesians chapter four, alongside other things like healing, wisdom, the capacity for wisdom that is supernaturally given beyond normal human wisdom, evangelism, speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues, shepherding, teaching, even faith is listed as a spiritual gift. You may have a supernatural capacity towards faith in God that the rest of us don't have. And if, if that's true of you, then that gift of faith is to encourage and build up the church family where, where we are weaker than you. The Holy Spirit gives these spiritual gifts for the sake of the church, for the sake of the faith community to be built up. But Paul is also referencing more broad categories here too. In verse seven and eight, when he's talking about the gifts here, we also see serving and encouragement, giving, leading, showing mercy. These are broad category, categories, and it's not exhaustive either. So many gifts can fit under these types of terms, this picture of what it would look like to serve. I love too, like this is all over the New Testament and Paul wrote half of our New Testament but Peter gets in on the action as well. Peter, one of the disciples, in one of the letters that we have written that we refer to as 1 Peter in chapter four, starting in verse 10, he says this to the, the people he's writing to, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the, and I love this, he turns it into a statement of worship because he's so excited about it. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. It's a prayer of worship at the end because he's so excited about the idea that everyone has a gift and God empowers that gift. And I wanna go back to verse 10 because this, this is so profound to, to just pause and think about. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others there we go, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God's grace to the world is given to us in various forms and your gift is a form of God's grace to the world. Your gifting is God's grace to people. That should stagger us for a moment. You have something to cultivate. You have something in you to offer that is actually God's grace to other people. It's profound. So here's what both writers are assuming. Number one, God has given you gifts. Number two, you are to use those gifts to serve others. You are to use those gifts to bring flourishing. You have been gifted by God and you're invited to cultivate those gifts and use them in whatever ways you're able and God intersects with those opportunities to bring healing and health and wholeness in some small but miraculous ways. So we are invited to develop a faithful imagination for how we can use our gifts, to be creative with the gifts that God has given us. Creativity is just that, imagine to see a new reality and work towards it on behalf of other people. Okay, so there's obviously different types of gifts. I, as I was thinking through this, I, I organized it in just sort of three categories. Maybe this is helpful for you. It was a little bit helpful for me. I'm, I'm sure that it's limited in some ways, but... Um, I wanna share just sort of three different ways to think about our gifting. So some of you have physical gifts. Um, working with your hands or the use of your body to create artifacts or art or a, a space. So think, it's, 
it's maybe obvious to point towards artists in, in this regard in some way, like um, visual arts or lively arts like drama or dance, but it, it's so much more broad than that. Um, craftsmanship, building, developing technology, factory work. If you work in a factory and you work with your hands, develop the skill of how to do that well because that's a gift. Manufacturing, medicine, style, physical therapy, culinary arts, cooking. I mean, there's so many different ways that you could think about the physicalness of how you can serve if you're gifted in those ways. So some of you have physical gifts. Some of you have mindful gifts. Uh, Using your thoughtfulness to create systems of order where there might be some chaos. Engineering. Steering public policy. I would be so terrible at that. I'm not gifted at that. But some of you are gifted in the way to think about public policy that would benefit people well. Um, Education. Business. Planning. Creating systems and structures. Management, whether that's Uh, Management of people or something like financial management. Poetry, prose, speech in various forms. Giving generously, I think, part of the transformation of our mind that Paul talks about leads to a mind that is, is bent towards giving generously. And some of you have a gift towards giving. Some of you have physical talent. Some of you have mindful gifts. Some of you have relational gifts. This is creating spaces of welcome or unity or movement forward together. So um, counseling, coaching, parenting in its various forms, conflict management. Maybe that's the same as parenting. (laughs) Hospitality. You can create a space of welcome and invitation when you work within hospitality. Caring for those at the end of life, mercy, serving, leadership, justice and reconciliation work, or simply listening. Some of you have a capacity to listen that the rest of us are losing in this day and age, and we desperately need you to use your gift well and to help steer us as someone who listens Now, obviously, these types of gifts get combined in different ways, and we see them used in different ways, in different styles, uh, in collaboration often. Um, I was thinking about, like, we have a lot of hairstylists that call Covenant Life Church home, and thinking about you as hairstylists, like, if you're good at styling hair, that's a physical gift that with your hands, you can create something beautiful with someone's hair. I don't know that feeling. It happens, though. I know you're out there. But, so like if you can create well with with someone's hair to create style, you'll be a good hairstylist. But if you also can cultivate a gift and have a gift of hospitality, how much then does that chair become a place where someone feels safe and welcome? And I have a lot of friends that are hairstylists that will share about like people just end up feeling comfortable and sharing about their life, and it becomes a place where they walk away, not just with a new hairstyle, but feeling cared for. It's a combination of gifts that's beautiful. Now, sometimes your gifting will have to do with your employment, your vocation, but not always. So eliminate that thought right now, because it doesn't have to do with that. Uh, We think often, for some reason, that if, if someone is going to be fulfilled, then they have to be using their gifts in an industry where their gift is needed. It's not true, though. And I hope this is an encouragement to many of you. Your work in a job that pays the bills, like maybe you work in a job that just pays the bills, but it isn't a place for you to thrive in your gifting, that's okay. That's okay. That's that's not a bad thing. Do that job well with all of the integrity and all of the skill that you can muster But also, find another place where your gifting can come out, where you can find a place where your gifts can be offered 
to other people. And what helps with that is seeing our gifts as a way to serve that changes the total perspective for how we view our talents or our skills or our abilities. The world will always want to measure success in financial terms, money, comfort, notoriety, influence. But if you see your gifting as a way to serve, you redefine success. So there's an artist, he's about my age, a little older than me, his name is Ned Bustard. He works out of Nashville. He's an artist and an author. Uh, He shared uh, through a video where his dad owned a small business and when he was a kid, he asked his dad about money. Talk to me about money. Like, how do you work with money? His dad's response was, money is how we keep score. Money is how you know you're successful. You're living life right based on your ledger. But as uh, Ned Buster had grown as an artist and as an adult, he has seen a different way to think about success. As an artist now, he asks questions of himself to help figure out if he's successful. He asks, are you doing what you're designed to do? Are you invested in a community and blessing that community? That is a different way to talk about success. And he creates visual works. He um, illustrates books. He's an author and he, he publishes books. But he also creates coloring pages for his church family's kids that connect with the sermon. And he sees that as a major part of understanding success for him as an artist. I think there's something we can learn from that. Only a small percentage of people in this world will develop their gifts into elite expressions of talent or skill, but there is endless opportunity to use your gift to serve, endless opportunity. There will always be a space for your gift if you're looking to serve. So we sent a team to Honduras just a few weeks ago, a small team. Um, we have a partnership with a church in Honduras called Vida Abundante, if you're not aware of that. Uh, we work with them in their, the villages where they are building clinics and schools. Um, we work with, alongside them in trying to figure out what are the next steps of our partnership. And this was the team that went down. Uh, Claudia is at the bottom there. She's our director of mission and belonging. Up at the top is Pastor Marshall. On the right is Ross. On the left is Rebecca. Ross is an engineer. Ross is a successful engineer. He also has business acumen. One of the things that we're exploring and that Ross was hoping to do on this trip, in the villages where there is just terrible poverty, some people are trying to figure out how to create small businesses. What would it look like for them to be mentored by people who are gifted in business? This is one of Ross's goals and roles in this trip down to Honduras and in trying to help us figure out what it looks like going forward in our partnership. And this has nothing to to do with him succeeding as an engineer. This isn't going to get him a raise. It's not going to get him notoriety. But it's going to turn us into a community of people that are able to mentor those in the villages trying to create a small business to help push against poverty and bring flourishing and health and wholeness. Rebecca is in medicine. We have clinics that Vida Abundante has founded, and she's been able to process or or start the, the, the process of figuring out what do steps look like in partnership with the clinics where we can help. How can we take people that are gifted in medicine, educated in medicine, have a a capacity towards it that can come down and be a help and an aid. And again, we see flourishing and health and wholeness because the people of Covenant Life Church get to be a part of that because Rebecca is using her gift well. There's endless opportunity and unique ways that you might not even know are waiting for you if you're using your gift to serve. Okay, so we wrap up with just a couple questions and then a short story. These questions might seem obvious to you at first, but hopefully these are good uh, 
trigger for you to kind of process and think about what it means that you are gifted and you should use that gift to serve others. So question number one, what are you good at? There's a good chance that you already know what some of these things are and you're gonna probably have more than one answer there. What are you good at? If you don't know how to answer that question well, especially if you're younger, prayer and conversation with those who know you best and love you is a really great starting point. Because out of those conversations and out of that conversation with God through prayer, you can start to see and hear from others how they've already experienced your gifting. What are you good at? Question number two, how are you using your gifts? How are you already using your gifts? And it doesn't have to be related to how you're employed. Are there areas you didn't even realize that you're working in an area of giftedness? If so, be affirmed and dive into that even, even more with the knowledge that that brings God's glory and grace. How are you using your gifts already? Um, and we sometimes think about this in terms of like uh, sphere of influence, like who, who can we influence? And a lot of times we think about that in terms of like, who am I in charge of or over? I would invite you, perhaps with Jesus as our model, to invert that. Um, Because my daughter, who is 12, she just turned 12, she's a maker and a creator. And she creates these little things. Um, She made me a wallet one time for Father's Day. And it's amazing, the craftsmanship of this thing with duct tape and paper, it's phenomenal. You laugh, it's phenomenal. And for her as a 12 year old to figure out that she can craft and create and make, she influences my life every day through that. I'm supposed to be the influencer, it's not true. She changes my world because of that gift. So don't just think in terms of who am I over, who am I in charge of, who can I influence from the top down. Think about who you can influence from the bottom up as a servant. Question three, how are you cultivating your gifts? This is different than using your gifts. This is growing your gifts, developing your gifts, your skills, your talents. It's a stewardship that Peter talks about in 1 Peter 4. It's a stewardship of God's grace to grow and develop those things. So whether that's education from various resources available to you, experience in the field of whatever that gifting is, enlightenment from others that have gone before you or have the same type of skill and gift. This is especially important if you're in a season where you feel the gifts that you're strongest in are lying dormant because those seasons happen. What can you learn in this season about your gifting and how can you develop it and grow it? This could possibly be an opportunity rather than just mourning that you don't have an outlet for your gifting. It could be a place where you can grow and develop the things that God has gifted you in. How can you find those small spaces to learn and grow and serve? And the the last question, question four, and this one might seem a little... Um, surprising at first, but are you willing to let others serve you with their gifts? Because we really like being served as long as it reveals something uh, of us still being in control. I paid for that service, so yeah, you can serve me. Contexts like that, we are okay with being served as long as we don't look like we're weak or lacking something, then we struggle. But the fact of the matter is, if the person sitting next to you is gifted in an area that you're not, then that person is called to serve you well with their gifting, and you get to be served. And that's a good thing. That allows them to be God's grace to you for his glory. Are you willing in the humbleness, the humility that Paul talks about, to let go of whatever pride it is that might say, no, I don't need to be served. 
Are you willing? That's a harder one. What are you good at? How are you using your gifts? How are you cultivating your gifts? And are you willing to let others serve you with their gifts? So I have an acquaintance named Sam. I've, I've kind of uh, lost touch with him over the last five, six years, something like that. But when I lived in Grand Rapids 10, 12 years ago, Sam, who is a songwriter and worship leader and a pastor and a writer um, and a teacher, an educator, he had come to Grand Rapids to work with a group of worship leaders that I had been working with along with some other friends at my previous church. Sam had come and he taught and he led us in worship as well. And I noted the beauty of the guitar that he was playing. I said, That's, that is quite the gorgeous guitar. So afterwards, things over. Everybody's taken off, heading home. The handful of us that were responsible for putting this all together are just kind of hanging out on the side of the platform. I said, Sam, do you, your guitar's beautiful. Do you mind if I play your guitar? He goes, no, 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 it should be played. And he hands me his guitar, and it really was. It was stunning. I'd never played anything like it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. He says, well, there's a story behind that guitar. At home in the state of Washington, and he was from Texas, this guitar shows up on his porch, and it shows up with a letter from a gentleman in Texas. This gentleman had said to God, you get one more chance. This gentleman had said to God, my life's done unless I hear from you. He had come to the very end, and he walked into a church, and he sat in the back pew and said, you got one last chance, and spoke to this gentleman and he was so stunned by how much he heard God tell him that he was loved. And a copy of that. He said, yeah, absolutely. Gave him a copy. Sam's name is at the top. It was a song that he had written that had been arranged for the choir. This guitar shows up at Sam's porch. It's a $25,000 guitar. There's a five-year waiting list from a single individual that makes this style of guitar who lives in Minneapolis. The man said, I need you to play this guitar and use it however you need to. He says, I can't, I can't accept this. I can't take this guitar. His response is staggering. The gentleman says to him, Sam, you have the gift of writing songs. I have a gift of making money. Let me bless you so you can bless the church. Something had changed so radically in this person's heart and soul because of the way God spoke to him in view of God's mercy that he poured out what he was gifted in for the sake of the church and the world. The relationship still exists. Every few years, a guitar will randomly show up on Sam's porch I don't know anything about guitars, Sam, but this one sounded nice, and I talked to the guy, and he said he really loves it. I wanted you to have it. And he said, Sam, you need to play these guitars. If there's ever a problem, I'll fix it. It's an extreme example. Many of us don't have that type of capacity, but maybe it can open your imagination a little bit. Because here we have someone who's gifted in making money and someone who's gifted at music and their, their gifts collide for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of others knowing God's grace. And you have something to offer that would echo that. Can we pray? We thank you for that, God, that we are known, that our hearts are open to you. We ask that you would speak in this moment in this afternoon, in this evening, and as we launch into the week, that you would speak to our open hearts and open minds to remind us of your mercy first, but then the goodness of your grace in giving us gifts that we could use to bless the church family and the world. Speak and lead us towards that end, God, that we would live open-handed humbly and eager 
to share the mercy that we know in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, risen and reigning Lord over all, our example of what it means to be a servant. And God's people said, amen.